Good morning. Hi. Thank you for coming in this ERC roundtable session. Uh, to reward you for coming in the first session of the day, I brought some goodies here. Uh, this is a leaflet explaining uh, the funding schemes of the European Research Council. And then if you're out of pens or you want to wear a, a, a pin, <laughs> feel free to take one when you, when you leave the session. Uh, okay, so my name is uh, Eftimia Briki, and I'm a scientific officer at the European Research Council. And uh, the purpose of this uh, session is to present um, in brief uh, our funding schemes, some uh, archaeological projects, also some tips, tips for potential applicants. And then uh, I will hand over to two of our ERC grantees that are attending the conference, Anne Brisbard and uh, Javier Fernandez Lopez de Pablo. Uh, from two of our projects to present their own experiences and projects and then we will open the floor for an open discussion uh, any questions you might have about the ERC or the projects that you will uh, hear about uh, uh, by uh, the researchers here okay right. Wanna come <laughs> okay. so let me start so as I said, uh, I will just uh, provide a brief overview of what the ERC is and uh, what type of grants we have, some tips uh, for uh, people who apply, and then just the three uh, examples of, uh, of projects, as we have two more uh, by uh, uh, Anne and Javier later. So uh, what is the mission of the European Research Council is to support high quality frontier research across all scientific fields. Uh, we are dedicated in selecting and funding the excellent ideas that have not happened yet and the scientists that are dreaming them up. And this is achieved through a bottom up individual based pan-European competition. Um, ERC has now become a benchmark for research funding in Europe. It is part of H 2020 under the pillar of excellent science and the budget for H2020 for the ERC was 13 uh, billion euro. Uh, and for 2009, the budget is more than 2 billion euros, which is the highest ever since the beginning of the ERC in 2007. So what does the ERC offer to its uh, grantees? Uh, creative freedom, independence, recognition, and visibility. Uh, researchers can apply with any research topic uh, and if they get funded, they have financial autonomy for five years. They can negotiate the best working conditions with the host institutions. And they can also attract uh, top researchers from uh, all over the world um, as team members or collaborators. Another uh, nice feature about the ERC grants as, is that they are portable. So if for whatever reason you need to change to another host institution, this is possible. And uh, ERC is a quality label, so you can attract additional funding and gain recognition. Who can apply? Excellent researchers of any nationality, any age, and any current working place in the world. That means you may currently be based in Australia, Japan, in Europe, wherever. You can still apply as long as you do it in conjunction with a host institution based in Europe or associated countries. If you have questions about which countries these are, you can ask me during the discussion. Um, and also as um, a parenthesis, as of 2019, uh, for the Synergy Grant that I will talk about uh, in a second, uh, one of the uh, PIs that collaborate in the project can be based outside Europe, uh, EU and uh, associated countries as well. And if granted, you need to spend at least 50% of your working time in the EU or associated countries. Now, uh, an overview of our funding schemes. Um, we have uh, five uh, grants. Uh, the three are probably the most well-known ones, starting, consolidator, and advanced. And they uh, concern different uh, stages of career. Um, starting grants from uh, two to seven years after PhD, consolidator seven to 12 years after PhD, and advanced grants are for more advanced researchers. And uh, the, the, the amount of the grant varies from 1.5 and 2 then 2.5 million plus additional budget for equipment or relocation. And these are for five years. 
Uh, as of 2018, we have relaunched an older type of grant, Synergy Grants, and these are for projects that uh, are a collaboration between two to four uh, principal investigators with their uh, teams at any career stage. There can be any combination of researchers, and this can be up to six years and up to 10 million. Um, and the, the main uh, thing that we're looking for in this type of grants is that the, the project could not have happened without the synergies between these people, whether it, it has to do with the interdisciplinarity or just different skills coming together to uh, make the project happen. Finally, there is the proof of concept grant. Uh, and this, this is a smaller type of grant and it's just for ERC grantees. Uh, and the uh, aim is to, uh, if you have a project and out of the project you have a, a nice uh, innovative idea uh, that ha can have marketable um, potential or can, uh, you think, if developed, can have a societal impact or an impact in the industry, uh, they, then you can apply for a proof of concept grant. And these are just for uh, one year and up to 150,000 euros to help you develop uh, the innovative potential of that idea uh, and prepare it either for the market or for whatever other uh, purpose you want to have. So this is the only aspect of um, the ERC grants that looks towards soci societal uh, or industrial impact. Now, uh, so how does it work? Uh, we have, uh, in the 2019, the current panel structure is this one. Uh, the European Research Council, the, the, the evaluation process, but also the monitoring and the administration is, is divided across 25 panels uh, and across three domains. So we have uh, life sciences, physical sciences and engineering, and social science and humanities, where I belong. Uh, I'm working with the panels SH5 and SH6 cultures and, uh, and cultural production, and the study of the human past, where archaeology and history usually find their home. Um, of course, I just want to point out that uh, this panel structure is not rigid. Uh, the panels are to be interpreted in a flexible and inclusive manner, uh, with uh, adequate space and arrangement for cross-panel and interdisciplinary proposals. So. If you have a project, a proposal that transcends the boundaries of these panels, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and there are mechanisms within the evaluation process that allow us to evaluate these proposals using cross-panel reviewers um, and remote re evaluators that have appropriate expertise. Um, the panels are more like a guideline rather than a rigid rule. Uh, now, a few words about the evaluation process. Uh, the, the three of the grants, the main three grants, start and consolidated or advanced, have a, a two-step review process. Uh, at step one is uh, the panel members of each panel, the teams of each panel that evaluate the proposals, uh, first remotely and then at the step one meeting. They retain some proposals to go to step two, where for start and consolidator, consolidator we also have interviews. And at step two, the proposals uh, are evaluated also by external evaluators that have the appropriate expertise. An important thing to remember is that at step one, only the first part, the extended synopsis of the proposal is seen and evaluated, whereas if you pass to step two, then the full proposal is available to the reviewers. For synergy grants, this process is a bit different, and uh, if you want, I can tell you more about it in the discussions. It has three steps. <clears throat> Now, how are the ERC project uh, proposals evaluated? We have only one evaluation criterion, and that's excellence. Excellence in terms of the research project, and excellence in terms of the principal investigator. Uh, when I say excellence in terms of the research project, what we are usually referring to is groundbreaking nature of the, the project, the potential impact, and in, in here we don't mean necessarily societal impact, but rather scientific impact, academic impact, impact in the discipline, uh, and the excellence of the scientific approach. In terms of the principal investigator, uh, the panel members are looking for intellectual capacity, creativity, creative thinking, and the commitment to the project so that to make it happen, to, to make the project feasible. Note that the, the host institution with which you are applying is not an evaluation criterion. Okay, now for some um, tips 
Uh, contrary to what you may think, ERC funds frontier research, including applied research. The budget is distributed among the scientific panels as a function of demand. So that means that the more proposals we receive in one panel, the, the more budget is allocated to that panel, and then the more proposals will eventually get funding. So bottom line is apply. Um, the panel descriptors do not represent ERC scientific priorities. Each panel has a set of descriptors uh, uh, that characterize it, let's say, but they're not ERC priorities. They're just there to help us kind of organize the evaluation process. And uh, also you can use them to indicate the type of project you have. But uh, you can, of course, have a project outside these descriptors, and it, it doesn't really uh, uh, have an impact on the evaluation uh, decisions. The success rate is virtually flat across the eligibility window. This concerns the starting and consolidated grants, where there are limitations of who can apply depending on their career stage. So what this means is that if you're a starting uh, grant ap applicant, whether you are two years out of PhD or seven years out of PhD, so at the end of, of the eligibility window, uh, our data show that uh, you, you, you have the same chance. Uh, the, the success rate is, is flat across that uh, eligibility window. Publication record is not decisive in selection decisions. And of course, the way that uh, panels view the publications and the bibliometrics differs from discipline to discipline and panel to panel. Uh, but generally, is not the, the, the first thing that uh, one uh, uh, uses to decide about uh, a project. And as I said, the host institution is not an evaluation criteria. Now, uh, particular emphasis is uh, given on multi or interdisciplinary proposals which cross boundaries between different fields of research or pioneering proposals addressing new and emerging fields of research or proposals introducing unconventional innovative approaches and scientific inventions. So it, you don't have to have an interdisciplinary proposals, but if you have, that's also okay. Uh, you can have just a new take on a traditional topic. You can have a, a new type of technology to apply on a topic and a conventional uh, scientific approach and so on. <clears throat> Now, some more practical tips. How to prepare and submit a, a successfully received proposal. Step one, have a bright, original, exciting idea, and then design a project around it to implement it. You also need a letter of support from a host institution where the project is to be carried out. Um, and a, a, an important tip is to also consider the balance when, when writing the proposal between addressing generalists and specialists and the difference between the first part of the proposal, which is the extended synopsis, and part B2, which is the full proposal. Uh, at step one, as I said, is the panel members that evaluate the proposals, and they're asked to evaluate uh, as, to act as generalists, um, which means that because the panel has uh, representation from across disciplines, so uh, they, cannot, they cannot all be experts in all different topics. So they evaluate mainly as generalists, and then at step two, uh, we have specialist uh, remote reviewers. Submit your proposal before the deadline. And for starting and consolidator uh, grant applicants, uh, a, a nice tip is to have mock interviews if you pass to step two to help you prepare for your interview uh, at step two. Also, if rejected, keep trying. We have data that show that three applications have a much higher success rate, and that's part uh, of the, the fact that the, there's a benefit in using the feedback you receive from the evaluation reports uh, when and you last applied. When preparing your proposal, ask yourself, does my project bring new, innovative aspects? Does it promise to go substantially beyond the state of the art? Don't be afraid to be ambitious, think big. Uh, know your competitors, what is the state of play uh, in your particular area, and why is your idea and approach outstanding and, 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 and uh, worthy of funding. Uh, I repeat again that only the, the extended synopsis of at step one uh, uh, is read at step one, so be concise and clear in your presentation of your uh, proposed project, uh, because uh, the evaluators, as I said, 
are not all experts in the field at step one, uh, so it's important to, to present it in a way that it's, it's uh, uh, clear. Also, consider how can I prove, support my case, are my goals realistic? Uh, really consider the feasibility of your project, how are you going to make it happen? Um, also consider the risk. We do encourage high-risk, high-gain proposals, but even when it's a high-risk proposal or, or a medium-risk or whatever, you still have to assess that risk and, and show how you plan to mitigate uh, the risk. And again, societal impact is not an evaluation criterion. However, that doesn't mean it can't be a part of the project. Uh, this is just to say that if you want to get inspired uh, uh, about the kind of projects that uh, can be funded, you can go to our website and browse through the ERC funded projects page and see what kind of projects we already fund. And now for some uh, statistics. Um, so far, we have uh, nearly 9,000 projects funded in, in all panels across domains. And uh, about 2,000 of them, the number now is a bit uh, higher with the new um, uh, evaluations that, we, that finished. Um, about 2,000 uh, projects in social sciences and humanities with an overall budget close to 3 billion. Uh, and of that, uh, we have 306 projects in um, the study of the human past panel, which is archaeology and history, and projects in or related to archaeology constitute about one third of the funded projects uh, in SH6, which is the panel uh, of uh, archaeology. Now, each year, the, uh, the, the panel SH6, study of the human past, uh, receives more than 100 proposals in or related to archaeology, and approximately 15 to 20% 20, 20 of them are funded. Here are some stats regarding the gender uh, and the host countries of archaeology projects currently funded uh, by the ERC, just to have an overview of, of what's happening. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, let me go now to present briefly some or uh, three of the projects uh, that have been funded uh, by the ERC that have some computational components in them. Uh, I hope I can tell them uh, right, because I'm not a computational archaeologist myself. Um, so if you have any questions, you can also uh, follow uh, the links and then uh, look, look them up online and, and learn more. So the first project is a project called AREA. Actually, we were hoping to have a team member from uh, the project uh, in this session, but uh, she couldn't uh, make it. Um, this is a, uh, a project uh, called uh, the Archaeology of Agricultural Resilience in Eastern Africa. It started in 2013. It has now been concluded this year. And uh, through fieldwork in Engaruka, Tanzania, and Konso, Ethiopia, and the subsequent data analysis using a range of scientific methods, soil analysis, agent-based modeling, GIS um, analysis, the project aimed to assess the long-term sustainability of these two East African agricultural systems, and furthermore, to present a frank and realistic appraisal of the role archaeological knowledge can play in sustainability debates today. Uh, they, they had uh, one of the postdocs, the one that uh, we were hoping to have uh, here, Tabitha Kabora, was in charge of the agent-based modeling component of the project, and she developed two agent-based models, uh, the S-Trapped and Garuka Sediment Transport and Capture Model that simulated the, 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 simulates the development of the fields, and the sediment capture technique demonstrating that the complex network of irrigated fields at Garuka was not necessarily centrally managed. And also, she developed the time machine model, techniques of irrigation management in Garuka, modeling agriculture choices in Nassim economies, that added farmer households as agents in the simulation uh, of the Garuka field system, demonstrating that despite what was previously thought, irrigated agriculture in Garuka is potentially highly sustainable, and therefore there might have been other factors, cultural and sociopolitical, rather than environmental, that led to the abandonment of the site. Apart from agent-based modeling, another uh, sort of computational aspect, uh, but in a more fun way, let's say, was a public outreach uh, output that the project had, which was Irrigate, an irrigation game that they used uh, uh, to, to uh, 
it was available through smartphones and they used it for the public outreach activities. Now, the, the, and the project was based at the University of York with the PI, uh, Dr. Douglas uh, Stamp. Uh, second project is uh, PAST, Pre-Columbian Amazon Scale Transformations. Uh, by examining the influence of pre-Columbian uh, land use and the impact and modern legacy of the 1492 Colombian encounter in four different regions of Amazonia, the past project aimed at an appraisal of human impact on the Amazonian forests in the past in order to contribute to the sustainability of these forests today and in the future by providing critical input to policy makers. This last aspect uh, is also what led to uh, a further grant uh, uh, that sprang out of this project, a proof of concept grant, uh, Futures. Uh, PI was Jose Antonio um, Riarte Mujica from uh, Exeter. Uh, and uh, with uh, uh, the team within the, uh, the first project developed an innovative UAV leader technology for its remote, remote sensing work package. And the success and innovative aspects of this new technology was attested by its application in a different socioeconomic context in this proof of concept grant, which resulted uh, from, from the original project. Uh, and, and in this proof of concept grant, uh, the UAV leader system was used to digitally document and interpret forest structure data to improve the environmental sustainability of the region. Finally, I wanted to uh, also present a synergy grant, just to show you what uh, type of grant a uh, synergy grant is, and that's Nexus 1492, based uh, in, in, in several different uh, universities, as I will show in a bit. Uh, New World Encounters in a Globalizing World. This project investigates, uh, investigated, uh, it's, it's been concluded, the, uh, the impact of colonial encounters in the Caribbean and the intercultural Amerindian, European, African dynamics at multiple temporal and spatial scales across the historical divide of 1492. Uh, it was a truly transnational, intercultural, and transdisciplinary project with uh, four uh, PIs originally and three host institutions, Leiden, Amsterdam, uh, at Constance. And uh, the, the impressive thing about it is that it, it has involved 38 scholars and researchers, including postdocs and PhD students from a variety of fields, archaeology, anthropology, bioarchaeology, human genetics, physical geography, computer sciences, biogeochemistry, geochemistry, and heritage, and museum studies. Uh, one of the components of the project was, was to have an impact uh, in the region they investigated by developing uh, education manuals uh, for heritage awareness. Um, and the methods they used uh, also vary by micro and DNA analysis, isotope geochemistry, archaeometry, artifact analysis, and network analysis. And that's about it from me. Uh, if you want more information, uh, here are some uh, links. If you want, I can share this uh, presentation with you. And um, now I will hand the floor to Anne Brisbard of Leiden University and Irene Vicato. Uh, from Project Set in Stone.